Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so what I will be talking about today is all uh, joint work with Olivia Beckwith, who's currently at uh, University, or University of Illinois, but will be at uh, Tulane uh, in the fall, actually. Oh. So um, you'll be pleased to know. So I, I will start by talking about uh, Gauss composition, and I'll start with the basics, so the or origins of, of the subject. You're, study, you're studying quadratic forms of in two variables, binary quadratic forms. And you want to know um, in which, for, for a prime P, uh, is P represented um, by a, the quadratic form Q? Um, with pl plugging in integers. And <clears throat> um, for example, um, Fermat showed that a prime is representable as the sum of two squares, um, if and only if either it's the prime two or it's a prime that's time root to one mod four. <laughs> um, so what about other quadratic forms other than x squared plus y squared? Well, this was studied by Gauss. And um, so now um, if D is, um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to be a non-square non -square integer congruent to zero or one mod four. So in other words, some discriminant of a binary quadratic form, a number that can be a discriminant of a binary quadratic form. Um, and so Q plus prim of D is going to be the space of it's basically the space of binary quadratic forms of discriminant D, but the prim means we're taking primitive binary quadratic forms. Do you see the coefficients as one? And um, there we're going to exclude negative definite forms. And this space has an action of SL2Z, the group of two by two integer matrices of determinant one. Um, And I'm treating it as a left action. And so it's basically um, treating x comma y as if it were a column vector. Um, and equivalence classes in the quotient space will be denoted with square brackets. <clears throat> and so um, if you want to represent primes, we'll, we'll restrict to odd primes for this slide um, by quadratic forms in this space. Um, well, you're certainly not going to, you know, it not going to be able to represent P unless D is congruent to a square mod P. Um, and <clears throat> so um, that's the converse is not true. But what is true is that every prime um, satisfying that condition is represented by exactly one class in um, this quotient space, except that I've written GL instead of SL, and you need that. And so I'll illustrate by example. Um, here's a discriminant minus 47 example where um, the, the class number is five. There, there are five classes of binary quadratic forms um, modulo SL, but there are only three classes modulo GL and two, two of them clump together. Um, and they clump together, um, well, as we'll see by with their inverses in the, in the class group. Um, although I haven't said this is a group yet. I, um, so, um, but yeah, you, you can see um, Yeah, the, the H prime um, such that minus 47 is a square mod P will show up in exactly one of these um, columns. And so, well, what is Gauss composition? So what is the, the I, I let slip that this is a group, um, as you might already know, um, but that the group law on this group is 
you know, you can specify it purely in terms of the quadratic forms. And the way you do it is you multiply your two quadratic forms together um, with using different variables, x1, y1, x2, and y2, and then you make a particular substitution and you get a, a third quadratic form, q3. And q3 is not uniquely determined by, in this way, but um, it, its class is uniquely determined. And this product defines an abelian group law on um, q, q plus prim d mod SL2z. Um, so now we'll, we'll move, we'll give a more modern interpretation of, of this composition law. Well, it's, it's the uh, group law in the ring class group. So what is the ring class group, um, everything in this talk is about quadratic fields. So um, well, we could, for the purposes of this talk, the, the order of, <laughs> the quadratic order of discriminant D is um, just defined to be um, the lattice uh, Z plus D plus square root of D over two. Z, and you can check that this is a ring. Um, and in particular, in the in the case when D is minus three, okay, you get you get the, the hexagonal lattice, the Eisenstein integers. Um, right. So does so you, know, you can ask, does OD have unique factorization into primes? Um, and you know, the answer is no. I guess that this is the most standard. The first example was, you know, maybe your most standard example of failure of unique factorization. Um, Q, you know, Q adjoined square root of minus five. But then you can also have examples of failure of, of unique factorization where you have a different number of factors on each side, like in the second example. And then this this third example is a, an example where the the maximal order z join i does have unique factorization, but if you move to um, a non-maximal order z join 3i, which is o so o sub minus 30, 36, you don't have unique factorization anymore. So in each of these examples, the, the factors are, are irreducible as as numbers, but um, and the, the factorizations are non-unique. Um, and so how do you fix this? Well, you look at ideals. And since we're talking about non-maximal orders, you, you have to look at invertible ideals. Um, so a fractional ideal is invertible if there's some, uh, um, some other fractional ideal that is its inverse. And you have to introduce fractional ideals at this point to make this make sense. If, you know, you're not going to multiply two integral ideals and get the whole order unless they're both OD. Um, and invertible ideals of OD will always ha satis ha enjoy unique factorization into prime ideals. And um, so if you want to factor, you know, numbers instead of ideals, you, you have to talk about principal ideals. Um, and you know, and so the, the obstruction to unique factorization is given by the, the non-principal ideals. Um, right, so for example, um, and so I'm gonna um, do this non-maximal order example um, just to show you, you know, word of what, what fits with, well, the usual story and what's a bit different in the, the non-maximal order case. Um, so um, the irreducible numbers each factor into, into products of two ideals, of two prime ideals um, as follows. Um, five is P times P prime and the other two are squares of P and P prime. Um, but um, where P and P prime are given as follows. Um, 
end. So that that's no different than the not than the maximal order case. Um, and so just then we want to, you know, we'll need to study non-principal ideals to understand the obstruction to unique factorization, right? But um, we do need to exclude non-invertible ideals from this consideration um, because you, know, you don't actually, yeah, you, you can't, um, yeah, they, yeah, they, they were very, all the sort of ni nice properties that you want um, ideals to have can sort of get, can go wrong when you start using non-invertible ideals. Um, so I um, won't get into the weeds of that, um, but I'll just say um, the ring class group is defined to be um, in invertible ideals modulo principal ideals. And the class number is one if and only if um, OD has unique factorization of numbers co prime to the conductor F. And you have to insert that co prime to the conductor F bit, or it won't be true. Um, and um, yeah, and so um, we'll also, um, so now, now we wanna tie things back to quadratic forms. So we need to introduce the narrow ring class group, um, which is just the um, almost the same definition, except now we're, we're modding out by a slightly smaller subgroup. So we're getting a slightly larger group. Um, we're, we're modding out by principal fractional ideals um, whose generator has positive norm. And the um, theorem is that this, this narrow ring class group is the same as the group described by Gauss composition. And, um, I've put Dirichlet's, uh, Dirichlet and Dedekind's name there for their role in re reformulating Gauss composition and defining ideals and um, so on. Um, so, but yeah, this is a, uh, um, but uh, now I, yeah, so, um, we're going to move into uh, class field theory now. So um, another interpretation of the class group or and therefore of the, you know, the quadratic form version of the class group will, is as a Galois group. Um, um, so if you ask the question, what are the abelian extensions of K? K in this case is a quadratic field. Um, it doesn't have to be, but um, is for this talk. Um, and if, um, I, don't, I don't know why I have the definition of ramification on here, um, but yeah, the... If you know that there's a extension um, HD plus, which is called the the Hilbert class field or the narrow Hilbert class field, such that its Galois group is precisely this class group, and that extension is defined as the maximal abelian extension um, that's unramified at every prime ideal of OD. <laughs> Um, and so the 
so now we have three interpretations of the same group. It's a, it's a group of quadratic forms, mod SL2Z. It's a um, narrow class group of ideals, and it's a Galois group. And how does this relate back to the question of representing primes um, by binary quadratic forms? Well, if um, phi is the isomorphism um, between quadratic forms and ideals, then um, you can represent P by the quadratic form Q if and only if the um, class of Q is um, equivalent um, in the class group to a factor P, um, one of the factors of P in OD. And by art and, art and reciprocity, um, you can restate this as a condition on um, in the Galois group, um, which is literally just applying the art map to, to two. The art map applied to a prime is, is Frob P, the, the Frobenius um, isomorphism associated to P. Okay. Um, are, there, are there any questions at this point before I move into part two? two? Okay. So your Q, bracket Q, is a class in this Q mod as well too, right? Yes, that's right. No, then what is this? What, so, so what does this equivalent to the prime ideal mean? Oh, uh, that's that's a typo. That should say phi of class of Q. Is oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so now I'm gonna get into ray class groups and okay, so ring class groups were, were nice. Why do we need ray class groups? Well, they, the ring class groups don't generate all of the, or the ring class fields don't generate all the abelian extensions of a number field. So if you wanna describe all the abelian extensions, you need some other stuff and the other stuff are um, ring are, are ray class fields that are associated to ray class groups, and so this this is this is the usual almost the usual definition of a of the ray class group with a, a small extension to allow for um, non principal orders. So M is going to be um, an ideal of OD, um, sometimes M and S will be grouped together and called a modulus, but I'm just writing S as a set, S is a set of real embeddings. Um, and the, the Ray class group of OD modulo M and S is, um, it's the same, way that it's almost the same as thing on the top as for the ring class group. It's invertible fractional ideals with additional co-primality condition. Um, but, and then you're modding out by a smaller um, subgroup. You're, you're demanding that your principal ideals have, have a, has a generator that's congruent to one mod M and it is positive at all the real places you're considering. <laughs> And so there's, and you know, the, the, there's an abelian, you know, and so there's an abelian extension associated to this, that's this group that's called, um, so that's called the Ray, the Ray class field um, and can be specified by conditions on the splitting of primes um, that I'm not gonna, detail, um, but the um, 
key property is that it's it's Galois group is this Ray class group. And so we talked to, and when we talked about narrow ring class groups, there was there was the the usual wide ring class or the wide ring class group, and then the narrow one. Um, but for ray class groups, um, there are like five different things you can do. Um, so you can do any subset of the um, of the um, infinite places, and um, so. Uh, the re so this will be this is this is going to be for the case d d greater than zero real quadratic field there um, so you can you have the four groups on the outside of this triangle and then you have the group in the middle where you sort of um, have a simultaneous condition on both places given which is you ask for the norm of your generator to be positive. So the product of the two real embeddings to be positive. Um, and that's the thing um, I'm gonna call the narrow ray class group. Um, this, this one at the top is, is narrower, but um, I needed a name for it. And so currently I'm calling this, this thing the narrow ray class group, because that's the thing that, um, is going to have a composition law that is related to quadratic forms. So, before I get to that, uh, this is this is what the associated field diagram looks like, um, and I've put in the base field K, your quadratic field, and the Hilbert class field as well, and so. Now for the refined Gauss composition law, or you know, so um, this is going to be a new space of quadratic forms where um, there's an n here. So an n equals one, it's the same space as before, but now we're going to consider um, quadratic forms where the leading coefficient is co prime to n. And gamma one will be the usual gamma one congruent subgroup, which is you know major um, major using SL SL two Z that are um, where the diagonal entries are one mod n, and the bottom left hand entry is zero mod n. Um, I'm using R S T and U to not conflict with the A B C in the quadratic form. Um, Okay, and so our, our first theorem is there's there's a bijection um, between the gamma one classes in Q prim n plus of d and the narrow ray class group, and therefore the, this um, set of gamma one classes has an abelian group structure given to it by the class group. Um, and this, I should say that this, um, this isn't totally new, this, this is, um, has been done for, for the, um, in the imaginary quadratic case um, for fundamental discriminants by Um Ku and Shin. Um, um, the, so, um, now I get, I'll talk about mapping, mapping forms to ideals. So how, how do you actually construct this map? Um, it's, um, similar to what you would do for Gauss composition, except you have to pay close attention to what you're doing with the leading coefficient, and then you have to check a bunch of things. Um, so, um, and you need to twist in a particular way. Um, at least in the real quadratic case. And so phi of Q, this map is defined as um, the, this 
lattice, which turns out to be a, an invertible ideal. Um, you have to check that. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's just a lattice right now, right? You have to check that that's an ideal in the right, in the ring, the uh, Z join tau, right? Or Z join A tau. Um, and then RQ is this, this twisting factor, which is a, a, a class of quadratic, of, sorry, of ideals. And so, you know, we have to check that that, well, we have to check that you get an ideal and that it's co-primed to N, uh, invertible, and you have to check that this map is gamma one invariant and that, well, that you get an uh, injective and surjective map. And none of, uh, all of these are fairly straightforward, but um, there's a lot of details to check. Um, right, and so rather than doing that, um, I'll discuss the results on um, representing primes and then move into the, our applications to modular forms. So if P is, is a rational prime um, and we're gonna, for simplicity, say it's co-prime to N and D. Um, so we already know, we already have an equivalent condition to representing P by Q. Um, so we need some something else, <laughs> and so we're, you know the condition is going to be we're representing p by q, but we also need m and n to m, to have a congruence condition on themselves. So m is one mod zero, and n is uh, one mod n, and m is one mod capital n, and n is zero mod capital n, and so that condition with the extra congruence condition is equivalent to um, 5q being in, in the class. Uh, okay, so I did it right this time. 5q equals class of p um, in, in the narrow ray class group where p factors is the product of the Fractor P and fractor P prime. Um, and by Arden reciprocity, you can give an equivalent condition in the Galois group. Um, so we'll, we'll do a, a few examples. So the first, um, here's an imaginary quadratic example, discriminant minus seven and conductor three. Um, the, the class group in this case, or the, the ray class group in this case is um, Z mod 4Z. So you get four classes of quadratic forms. Um, you recall that the, you, you can, the, the actual class, no, the, you know, it's the, the ring class group is, is trivial in this case. So all, all these forms would be equivalent, except that, um, except that they're not. Um, when you impose this stricter notion of equivalence. So you get four different classes and these two, um, give you the same set of primes. Um, and that's basically because um, those two are, are swapped under Galois conjugacy, whereas this class is fixed by Galois conjugacy, so it doesn't have a pair. Um, and I'll zip through the other examples because they're very similar. Here's a real quadratic example. Um, and again, every, you know, you're, you're getting all of the, all of the primes that, that satisfy the the co simple condition showing up in one of these lists. Um, and here's another real quadratic example. And in this, this is a this is an example where actually all of the classes are fixed by Galois. So um, you get these eight different classes, and they're they each just have one quadratic form. One, well, you know one gamma one of n class in it. Okay.
so before I, yeah, so I, I get, I should ask again, are, are there any questions at this point? Okay. Um, yeah, so as an example, uh, so as a, sorry, as an application, we'll, um, uh, you know, our results on this refined Gauss composition and other tools, uh, we'll prove a formula for leading coefficients of HECA L series for real quadratic fields as um, a twisted trace of biharmonic MOS forms. And I'll tell you what that means um, in a several slides, um, but I wanna discuss the motivation um, for looking at this a little bit. Um, so, Um, I've talked about, I talked about class field theory earlier in the talk. Um, and so for, I'm just going to zoom out a bit and talk about a general number field, not even necessarily, not necessarily quadratic anymore. And we're asked, we, the, you know, the same question we asked before, what are the finite abelian extensions of K? And the answer is given by class field theory. They correspond to quotients of Ray class groups. Um, but that's an abstract description. What about an explicit description where you say, oh, here are the generators of fields, you know, explicitly. Um, and mm -hmm. for the rational numbers, you can give, you can answer this question. You can say, oh, the, you, every finite abelian extension is contained in a cyclotomic field. And the cyclotomic field has, you know, explicit generator, b to the two pi i over n. Um, and so Hilbert's problem asks for an analog of the kronecker weber theorem for other number fields. In other words, an explicit description of the finite abelian extensions of K. Um, and an one, another case where this is, where we've answered Hilbert's 12th problem is imaginary quadratic fields. Um, so if you have, um, the um, okay, the, the ring of integers, you know, the maximum order in K as written as a lattice, Z plus tau Z. Um, and we look at the J function, um, the modular J function, which has the following Q expansion um, or A expansion. And um, the, The um, theorem um, is that the maximal abelian extension, the maximal unramified abelian extension of K, uh, the, the sober class field is um, K joined J of tau. Um, and um, uh, this. And um, the finite abelian extensions of K are, can be generated by, by the, the special value of the J function and also by uh, um, special values of an elliptic function. Um, and so we can ask, well, what about real quadratic fields? Um, and what is the, the simplest thing you could do? You could just try to use the J function again, um, um, but that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? The J function is defined on the upper half plane. It's not gonna make sense a, a real quadratic number. Um, so instead of just evaluate, instead of evaluating it, you could try taking an average over a geodesic path in the upper half plane. Um, so for example, you know, there's sort of a natural choice of geodesic path. If you, have, if you start with a real quadratic number, you can look at, you know, tau and the, the Galois conjugate tau prime and draw the path between, between those two and then look at the average of, this, of the J function on that, that path. And um, 
that seems seems reasonable enough. Um, and it, it shows up elsewhere in number theory that these cycle integrals are, um, as we'll see, are, are um, related to, to coefficients of harmonic MOS forms, or weak harmonic MOS forms, more, more precisely. But um, the um, but for the J function, um, these seem to be transcendental numbers. I mean, it's it's hard to prove the numbers are transcendental, but you know they they sh they don't appear to be algebraic. So maybe instead of the J function, try like some other modular functions or something. Well, so so yeah, I'll say a bit. You know, I'll say now precisely what I mean by cycle integrals. Um, so. Q is going to be a quadratic form of positive discriminant, and SQ is going to be uh, the associated semicircle. Um, so that, which, <clears throat> is basically, you know, as I said, that the, the, um, the um, path in the upper half plane. There's the straight line path in the upper half plane between two uh, roots of, of a, you know, a quadratic that's uh, obtained from this quadratic form, um, right? Uh, so S is the semicircle and if you look at the action of, S, of SL2Z on the semicircle, you get um, it that it's a cyclic, infinite cyclic group and it has, so say GQ is a generator for it and fix some point W, um, that's one of those two red points on SQ and look at a path CQ from W to GQW. Um, so that's the other red point. Um, and you can define the cycle integral of f um, over cq to be the following integral of f of z against um, dz over q of z1. And that um, differential was chosen to, to make this invariant under everything. So invariant under the both the choice of W and the, the action of SL2C um, on, on SQ, or on, on Q. So long as F is a modular function. Okay, and Instead of just looking at one cycle integral, you could package them together. Um, I've written a whole for a holomorphic modular function f. Um, this all this makes sense for non-holomorphic modular functions as well. Um, you can package them all together into a, a twisted trace, um, twisted by any character of um, the, the class group. And so there's a theorem of Duke Imamo Wu and Toth from 2011 that says, um, at least for genus characters, um, the values of this twisted trace for the J function are the coefficients of a weight one half mock modular form. Um, and, you know, the You know, the, the modular that, you know, yeah, yeah that's, it's like, it's basically the, the D coefficient um, and the, the modular form is, you know, so you're pack, your package, you know, there, there's a, you're packaging together different chi um, and which is associated to some other, um, 
So you said this is the DS coefficient. Is it still transcendental or is it algebraic? It's not? this is transcendental, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, but I'm about to give another example where you're getting something algebraic. Well, not something algebraic, not exactly algebraic, but like logarithms of things that are algebraic. Um, so, um, and this will be an example of, you know, this more general setting. Um, and so I'm not going to say what, exactly what polyharmonic means for a few slides, but there's some, some sort of more general class of modular functions called polyharmonic. Um, it's more general than just looking at holomorphic modular functions um, and that are, um, and such that their, their twisted traces are coefficients of the holomorphic part of a half integral weight polyharmonic weak MOS forms. Um, And an example here is um, the function f of z that's defined to be minus log of y, where y is the imaginary part of tau times absolute value of dedicated function of tau to the fourth. And so eta of tau is you know, the eta the function. Um, and this particular expression um, appears in um, the Kronecker limit formula. Um, and which is a formula for special values of, of L functions. Um, and so more specifically, <laughs> what is the Kronecker limit formula? So I, if you have, um, if you define EK of tau S to be this Eisenstein series, so this is the um, a re real analytic Eisenstein series of weight K. Um, and um, in the weight zero case, It's that's the the Kronecker limit formula is a formula for um, the the first two terms of the Laurent expansion. So the, the leading term is just two pi over s minus one, um, and then the constant term involves this special function, um, which is basically the logarithm of of a modular function, but I'm calling it, I'm saying that it's polyharmonic. And so, um, and um, I should mention that there's a connection to imaginary quadratic fields. If you specialize tau to be um, imaginary quadratic, um, this Eisenstein series is a partial ideal class data function. Um, so this can be used to, to give um, yeah, for, formulas for special values of, of the heck L functions for imaginary quadratic fields. So um, I should yeah, and so there's there's an analog for positive discriminants. There's several analogs, in fact, but there's a version due to Hecke for this um, partial zeta function sum over. So the a is a is a class of uh, of ideals in the class group, um, and the formula looks like that kind of messy, um, but yeah, there's there's a, a constant term that doesn't depend on A, the class A, and then a, a or, a, or, a, or a, a residue that doesn't depend on A, and then a constant term that does, and it 
uh, instead of getting a value, special value of this function, you're getting a um, that cycle integral of this function now. <laughs> and if you're, you were to put in a character, you'd be getting a twisted trace of this function. And your E is the fundamental unit, right? And E is, the epsilon is the fundamental yeah, unit. Okay, yeah, epsilon, yeah. And Q depends on A. Q is basically phi of A in the notation from earlier. Um, sorry, phi of Q is A, I should say. Um, and so um, I'll give a more precise version of this later, but that we, we can obtain a, a generalization um, of this formula for um, the Ray class setting, um, but instead of involving the special function involves other polyharmonic mass forms for a congruent subgroup. Um, so let me now say what everything means. So yeah, gamma is going to be a congruence. If, if gamma is a congruent subgroup um, and R is a, a half integer, you can define a polyharmonic MOS form of weight K and depth R to be a function on the upper half plane um, that's modular of weight K in the usual sense. Um, and that vanishes, um, so harmonic would mean vanishes under the Laplacian, or and um, this is the weight K Laplacian, um, but we take an rth power of the Laplacian and say it doesn't necessarily vanish under the Laplacian, it vanishes under some power of the Laplacian. And then there's a growth condition, and this is the, the strong version of the growth condition, and um, which is all we'll consider in this talk. polynomial growth of the cusps. And um, R was a half integer. So what's a half power of the Laplacian? Well, it's the Laplacian factors is two Brunier Funke operators, a composition of two Brunier Funke operators, psi k. And so you can use that to make sense of the definition for um, half, half, pow half integral powers. Uh, for R, R equals a half, um, vanishing under this Brunier Funke operator is the same as being holomorphic. Um, for R equals one, these are harmonic MOS forms. Um, for R equals three halves, um, they're called sesquiharmonic, one and a half harmonic. Um, but, uh, and that includes the case of the function that appears in the Kronecker limit formula. Um, and in the R equals two case, um, they're biharmonic. Um, and we're gonna denote the space of these form of these functions by VK of R gamma. And so in the level one case, N equals one, um, you can show that the, um, the space is spanned by cusp forms and um, the first R Taylor series, ta Taylor series coefficients of the Eisenstein series. Um, so for example, if you look at the weight zero Eisenstein series, um, the zeroth coefficient will be in M zero of gamma. Well, will be in the, you know, M, the space of holomorph um, holomorphic modular forms and, you know, so on. And you get this helix diagram here. Um, be, so ha um, half of the spaces are missing and that's because they're just in equal to um, the space one below it. So v VK one gamma is the same as VK one half gamma. Um, and so there are several generalizations of this. Um, Anderson, Ligarius, and Rhodes studied um, the case of other eigenvalues other than the, the zero eigenvalue. Um, so uh, generalized MOS forms um, with a weaker, 
um, Matsuzaka studied weaker growth conditions um, and half interval weight. And our, my work with Olivia is concerned with um, the, the level N case of the, of Ligarius and Rhodes, the, you know, level N analog of Ligarius and Rhodes original work. Um, and so if, if you look at, you know, so, so now we need slightly more general Eisenstein series. I realize I'm getting low on time. So I'm gonna maybe rush a little bit. Um, so these, these Eisenstein series can be meromorphically continued. This, um, but we're, we're offsetting now, but offsetting the, the lattice by two rational parameters, Q1 and Q2. And so you look at the, you can, so this is just notation for the Laurent expansion that you, you get a, um, <clears throat> a pole of order one at S equals zero or at most order one at S equals zero. Um, and you can, you expand the, the Eisenstein series as a Laurent series of um, call the coefficients B with all the your decorations. Um, and <clears throat> our result is that these Bs um, for rational numbers of denominator N give a basis for the space of polyharmonic MOS forms. And there's an, ex an example. Well, but, uh, and, but as before, you get this helix diagram um, whenever the weight is greater than two. But in the special case of weight zero or weight two, um, you get a double helix <laughs> of, um, you know, the, the, you get new, new, new forms at each depth or depth new forms at each depth <clears throat> in, in both towers. Um, and okay, so f I'll finish with the connection to um, ray class groups. So the Hecke L function, the, the Heckel series is um, defined like that. Um, some overall ideal classes with a character. Um, ideals that are co-prime to the conductor or, or that are not co-prime to the um, conductor should, or that they're not invertible should, should have a, you know, Coefficient uh, zero, coefficient of zero, but um, yeah, it's a, a little bit, a little bit of some some delicate things you need to take care of. But um, basically, yeah, the the product of these Heckel functions give you Dirichlet, which give you Dedekind zeta functions for the totally real abelian extensions of K, um, and in the case when this L function vanishes to degree two at S equals zero, there's a prediction for what um, the leading term should look like. Um, and it, well, and in that case, it's, it predicts that it's, um, it's supposed to be some sort of regulator, um, but in particular, it's supposed to be a, a quadratic form in logarithms of units in abelian extensions. Um, so it's the roughly we, we, weakest, weak way to say it. Um, but yeah, um, the, and so here's our result. Um, it's a new, new uh, formula for um, this leading coefficient in the case when um, you have a character the factors through the the ray class, the usual, um, the you know wide ray class group, um, 
you can give a formula for this leading coefficient as some sort of twisted trace. And the integrand here is a bi biharmonic MOS form. It's this B that was defined as a, a, a coefficient of an offset Eisenstein series. And the proof idea is, is based on Hacke's method in the, you know, for Hacke's chronic Lemma formula. And um, so I'll do a real quick example um, relating this to the star conjectures. So, um, so for K is Q joins square root of 23 and conductor five, um, the narrow ray cross group has order 12 and you could, so if you can, and you can consider a, a Keke character of order three and which defines some degree three abelian extension. Um, and this is a case when, uh, well, the total Galois group is, is S3 symmetric group. And so in this very special case, um, it's not something you can do in general. You can express the Hecke L series and, as a quotient of Dedekind zeta functions. And so you can basically compute everything. You can, you can prove the star conjectures and just using um, the, the class number formula. Um, and this is the quadru this is the cubic polynomial defining the, the like, intermediate cubic extension M. And so you can combine the class number formula with our result. Um, and so this, this is just to give an explicit example showing how, you know, this quadratic form in logarithms of, of units in a B, an abelian extension is a, a twisted trace of a biharmonic MOS form. Um, and so you know, we don't know how to prove formulas like this in, in any cases beyond what you can do by these sort of tricks, but um, it's, it's sort of an, an intriguing formula. <laughs> Um, so I will stop there. Um, thanks, for, thanks for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Any questions? So can you use your formula to compute special values? I thought someone would ask that. So um, <laughs> I've thought about that a bit. Um, I think that... Probably, but it probably won't be the fastest way to do it. I, I like I, I've, yeah, I, um, I think that using um, Shintani decomposition is probably faster than than this, um, at least based on anything I I currently know how to do. I, it's it's, it seems like the sort of thing that, that could lead to new computational tools, but I, I don't know of a way to, do, to use it to compute special values that would be um, as good as Shintani decomposition. And I, I, I guess, yeah, and so that's, that's compu computation in the sense of co using a computer, I guess in the sense of like, you know, proving things about special values. Um, yeah, there, there might be potential there too, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Well, uh, your cycle integrals are sort of reminiscent of Eichler integrals in the holomorphic case, although it's, they go between different values. And an Eichler integral goes between cusps. Yeah. But this yeah, is so, cusp. It's going between these real quadratic values. So I, I, I don't have a good feeling for what they might be. Uh, right. Yeah. At all? They're not, yeah, they're not Eichler integrals, but yeah, no. they, there is. Yeah, so the, there is a way to um, in you know, for 
you know, level one genius characters, there's a way to, you know, relate these twisted traces to a, to a theta lift. Um, and that's, that's how you get this the result of Duke Momo Lewin-Toth and Matsusaka's generalization. Um, so we're, we're exploring that, um, the generalizations of that, but. Um, you know, it's curious that you mentioned theta lifting because you know, the, I'm somewhat familiar with the theory of theta lifting, but in a holomorphic context. You yeah. Know, do you know the theory of special cycles of Kudla Milson? Yeah, I'm somewhat, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it. It relates topological cycles on certain symmetric spaces, things like these uh, GD6 things with theta lifts of certain automorphic forms. But the, the version of it that I'm semi-familiar with is in the holomorphic world. So this is something completely new to me. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with Kubla Milson to say exactly how it's related, but I, I, I think that, you know, I would suspect that it's related, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I don't, um, yeah. And so is there any reason that you choose the particular uh, geodesic path? Um, no, no, there, so there's, I didn't really make any choice. So I, I made, I made choices that don't matter, right? I, I chose, um, you know, the choice of the quadratic form won't depend on the, the class of the quadratic form. Um, mm -hmm. And the choice of your starting point won't depend on, you know, won't affect it the integral either. Okay. Yeah, there's cool. a whole theory of these kudla milson cycles, but I, th as I said, the, the tiny piece of it that I ever encountered was for holomorphic modular forms and Ziegel modular spaces and so on. This is a different context, but it seems to me that this theory of kudla milson and there's a, also a Tong and Wang, there were two Japan, or Chinese guys, mm -hmm. they developed a whole theory of these special cycles that are not limited to the holomorphic situations. And so these geodesic cycles appear as special cycles in that theory, but I don't know how they connect or if they connect to MOS forms or any of that stuff. So probably you should give this talk to Steve Kudla and see what he says. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah, I should definitely talk to him at some point. <laughs>